Life Over Coffee, Conversations for Transformation. An unguarded strength is a double weakness because we rarely guard our strengths because we think of them as good, and strengths are good in one sense. But we need to realize that our abilities can entrap us, keeping us from relying on God. Remember, God will not compete with us strength to strength. God wants weakness, and He puts His strength in weakness in jars of clay so that His surpassing power can be made known to all. Let me illustrate my point with a counseling session that I had a number of years ago with a mother and daughter. The child's strength was her intellect, which was propelling her to do well in school. The unguardedness of her skills, of her talents, created a darkness in the child's life that brought them to counseling. If we are not wise in stewarding our strengths, we can become blind too, just like this mother and daughter. Hello everyone, this is Rick Thomas at lifeovercoffee.com. Please check out our coffee shop. We have millions of words for you. They are free. Please take advantage of them and share them with your friends so that you can have conversations for transformation. If you want to read what I'm about to share with you, the title of it is, When Education Becomes Deadly to a Child. You can read it, you can watch it, and or you can listen to it. Let me share with you this counseling session, When Education Becomes Deadly for a Child. Mabel came to counseling to talk about her daughter, Bifina. Bifina is 13 years old and has been acting out recently. It has been chiefly anger and a sassy attitude toward her parents and little brother Biffy. Mabel added that Bifina had not been eating and may be struggling there too. Mabel noted how her anger Bifina's anger had escalated over the past year and she did not know what to do about it. She also talked about her husband Biff as well as as well as Bifina's teachers. You see typically when a mom or dad come to me for counseling regarding one of their children there are some specific questions that I need to ask the parents about the parents. The reason is, is that a 13-year-old child does not typically become as rebellious as Mabel described regarding their daughter without some assistance. In many of these cases, I dare say most of these cases of teen rebellion, this is more than just a child problem. I reject the cultural lie that says that the teen years are predetermined to be years of rebellion, like this is just what teenagers do. It's almost like saying uh, the terrible twos, that this is just something that has to happen. No, it, it doesn't just have to happen, and there are some things that we can do about it. You see, Christians can factor in the gospel's transformative power into an individual's life, and the gospel is the perfect antidote for rebellion regardless of an individual's age. And though they are exceptions in that some children will rebel without the adverse shaping influences of their parents, more times than not, there are things that the parents have been doing that facilitated the teen's rebellion. Let me be careful here. I am not saying that the parents are the cause of the child's rebellion, but they can impact and influence. They can have these negative shaping influences that can motivate a child push a, a child toward rebellion, even though ultimately it is the child's fault. I was like this. I used to blame my parents for my actions, but no, I am the one that made choices all along the way. But it would be intellectually dishonest to say that my parents had no input in the path that I was choosing to go down. As things turned out for Bafina. There were some specific things that Mabel and Biff could have done differently. In this case, it was a kid's problem 
and a parent's problem too. Now, the interesting thing about this situation was that Mabel knew it was a parent issue, but she would not admit it in the beginning of our counseling session. She presented the case as though it was all about Bethina and what they needed to do about it. It baffled them. She was not being honest with me. I am not saying that she was just intentionally lying but there was some self-induced self-deception here because ultimately Mabel did not want to tell me about how her husband was a significant culprit in Bifina's rebellion because Mabel felt hopeless that Biff would ever change. Rather than being honest with me about the situation, about their marriage and their parenting strategies, she presented it as a teen rebellion and wanted me to fix their daughter. Counseling was a last-ditch effort for a mom who she fell between a rock and a hard place. She could not change her husband, and she knew that, so she hoped that she could hire me to fix their broken daughter, and that is not how it works at all. I understood her hopelessness, though, but Mabel could not skirt the parenting problem if she wanted restoration. Biff was part of Bethina's problem, and as long as he was unchanging, it would have a distinguishable negative impact on how Bethina chose to live through her teenage years. I mean, it's like trying to lose weight while stuffing down a six-pack of soda. And, well, it's diet soda because that makes our consciences feel better. And then eating three Snicker bars a day. You cannot maintain the wrong behavior and expect a different result. Biff and Mabel could not continue in their habits and hope Bethina changes just magically. They were presuming on the grace of God. The intent of counseling was never to do what Mabel wanted it to do. If the grace of God were to intervene mercifully, it would be within the scope of God's domain and it would be God's prerogative. He's the one that grants repentance, not me. God's grace can overcome our foolishness. But again, we should never presume. We should never take for granted God's grace to do what we know that we should do. And so with this reclarification in view, as I laid it out for Mabel, I began to ask Mabel specific questions about what was going on. I asked, for example, you talked to her teachers. What did they say about Bethina? Mabel told me that Bethina's teachers were surprised that she was rebellious, not Bethina. Their perfect, uh, perception of her was that she was a, a model child. In fact, Mabel talked to six of her teachers from this year's class and some of her previous teacher from, uh, teachers from former years. All six of them, past and present, had similar stories. Bethina is a wonderfully compliant child. you got to be kidding me. How could she ever be rebellious. She has never caused a minute's trouble and is an academic example to all of her classmates. So said her teachers and they were telling the truth. But the real truth, or in addition to that truth about Bethina, is that she is rebellious in every area of her life except in school. The school is the only place where she is a model child. Now, this information was helpful on several fronts. For example, it told me that Bethina could behave. There was not some kind of organic limitation, some kind of genetic defect to where she could not be moral, that she could not uh, act out what scriptures taught as far as good behavior. 
Bafina could change. These things are character issues that were in play, not physical limitations. Character issues are repentable. If there were organic problems in Bafina's life, then yeah, there would be a very tight circle around her behavior, and she could not mature beyond those organic limitations. But the truth is, Bafina could be nice if she wanted to be nice, and she could misbehave if she wanted to misbehave. She had the ability to choose right or wrong, and her teachers have seen her choose right behavior over and over again, which is why they were so surprised that this little child would be rebellious anywhere because she was a model of perfection. And so I asked uh, Mabel, I said, what does your parenting model look like in your home? Mabel told me that she spends most of her time with Bafina, while Biff spends most of his time with Biffy. Mabel was unsure why it was that way, but that is how they have always done it. During this part of the conversation, Mabel told me that Bafina asked her when she was maybe four or, or five years old, Mommy, why does Daddy play with Biffy and does not play with me? The effects of their parenting stirred an instructive question from little Bafina's heart. She was struggling with a situation that would soon set the trajectory for the rest of her life, though she did not know it then or now. Mabel did not know the significance of Buffina's question about her daddy, though she was beginning to understand now what Buffina had been harboring in her heart all these years. What does Biff's relationship with Buffina lack? Mabel said Biff rarely encourages his daughter. Though their home, their, their home is not overly hostile or discouraging, it is not where active and intentional building up and encouragement occurs. After chatting with Bafina, it became apparent that affection and attention from her daddy was paramount to her. From her perspective, Biff seemed preoccupied or disinterested or distant. At times, he even came across as angry, according to Bifina. Bifina assumed as a young child that, Biff would be, that Biffy would be okay if something happened, if something terrible happened to their family. Biffy would be safe but she was not as confident Daddy would protect her. And when I finally met with Bafina, I asked her during a long conversation and after many questions and the relational bridge was established, I finally got to something that I really wanted to know. Bafina, what are you more aware of? Your Daddy's correction and displeasure in you? or your daddy's affection and encouragement of you. And it was incredible. Bafina's eyes began to water immediately. She had already figured it out. Daddy loves Biffy, but he does not love me. Her dad's lack of affection for her created confusion in her heart. It was a setup for personal failure in her life. And the results of their parenting model also explained why she was so angry. Then she hesitated, but she finally murmured that her daddy rarely encouraged her and that she always felt he was displeased with her. She did clarify how many times it was not necessarily because of what he said as much as it was about his quietness, his distance, his preoccupation, and, of course, his obvious affection for Biffy. Sometimes when I do a conference at a local church, I, especially if it's on biblical counseling, I will ask all the folks in the room, how many of you are, are biblical counselors? And 
almost, well, always, only a few people, a sprinkling of people, depending on the size of the group. It's a hundred, if it's a hundred people I'm talking to, five would be an enormous number of folks who would raise their hand and say that they are a counselor. And then I would begin to explain to them that everybody is a counselor. And I would talk about how counseling is not just what you do and say, but it is also the things that you don't do and don't say. For example, in Biff's situation here, he is counseling his daughter. He has been counseling Bethina now for over eight years. Whenever she asked that question a long time ago, why does daddy love uh, uh, Biffy but does not love me? And she had already come to the conclusion because children are interpreters and there is no data that is neutral. All data comes with an interpretation and, may, and, and uh, Bethina supplied the interpretation. Daddy loves Biffy. He does not love me. Daddy has been counseling Biffina all these years through his quietness, through his distance, through his preoccupation, and through his obvious affection for Biffy. Quietness is counseling. It's bad counseling. The silent treatment is awful counseling. Being preoccupied with other things and not your children, that is counseling. It's awful counseling, but everybody is a counselor, and so we have to choose how we are going to counsel, doing it the right way or doing it the wrong way. The church was one of many contexts where Bifina was rebellious. She really disdained church. The parents' response to her disdain for church or disdain for religion was to press the issue. You know, if they're not liking it, just double down and force it on them. They saw it as another aspect of her rebellion and they knew that they could change her by force. Wrong. And sadly, they were not discerning the problem. Bethina rebelled because it was her way of working through her personal struggle with God. She did not know how to have a relationship with God because the primary authority father figure in her life was, it was Biff. And it, demotiv it, it demotivated her to want to have a relationship with another father. Bethina felt her dad's displeasure and naturally assumed God's anger toward her. If daddy does not like me, God must not like me either. There must be something wrong with me. Bethina believed God was angry with her. From her perspective, it was like being thrown in a room with an angry person, so Bethina became angry too. She said God seemed distant, and Bethina did not know where she stood with the Lord. And though she believed that God saved her when she was nine years old, there was still this, this inward, awkward, nagging, and uncertainty about her relationship with God. Bethina said that she needed to perform for God to stand well with Him. And though she knew her thinking was incorrect, that she couldn't please God through her work, she had heard that in Sunday school somewhere. There was still this yearning in her heart to do right to be accepted by God. And when I began to talk to Bethina about her school, I noticed an almost immediate change in her disposition. She perked up and she was glad to tell me about her straight A's. In fact, she told me three times in five minutes that she was an A student. One of the things her mother said to me was that Bethina learned in kindergarten that she was brilliant. Shortly after entering kindergarten, Bethina found her niche. Bethina had a gift, and that gift was her intelligence. An unguarded strength is a double weakness. I mean, who would think to guard their strength? Who would think to, to be vigilant over their strength? Who would think that they need to steward their strength, that it, their strength would actually ensnare and captivate them? When Bethina began turning in her papers in her, uh, to her first grade teacher, 
the papers would come back with stars on it and and it would have smiley faces across the top of them. How Bilfina felt in those moments of getting her papers back was something she rarely felt at any time in her life, especially in her home, partic particularly with her relationship with her father. Bifina felt appreciated. Bifina felt loved. She felt approved. Bifina had a, a God-given strength, which was her intelligence, and she learned how to use her intelligence because she realized that her intelligence would be a gateway to many good things, especially satisfying this desire for love and significance. I asked Bafina about her excellent grades and what they meant to her. She said this, Daddy told me a long time ago the best way I could make him happy was to make all A's. Daddy doesn't care for the lack of effort, particularly in school. He said he did not try in school, which was his worst mistake. He does not want me to do poorly in school. And so Bafina took his warning to heart. From her perspective, she saw it as fortunate to be a bright kid. Bafina saw it as a gift, though it blinded her to how her greatest strength was also her most significant weakness. The raw truth was that neither she nor her father and mother could see how her pursuit of good grades and excellence through education was just straight up hardcore idolatry. Bafina was an idolater and her daddy was one of the corp culprits pushing her deeper into idolatry. The more we talked, the more open Bafina became. She eventually shared with me how she cheated on a test on one occasion last year. I was the first person that she ever let in on her secret. Bafina was so hungry for attention from her daddy that she rationalized the cheating. Her guilt-ridden conscience had eaten away at her for over a year, but her craving for love was more significant than her temptation to sin. But her guilty conscience was another reason that she had an aggravated relationship with God and almost everyone else except for folks within the school environment. She was getting the love that she craved through academic success, but in her heart of hearts, Bafina knew that she was getting her fix on at a high price and her frustration mounted. To make matters worse, the unresolved guilt in her conscience began to work out in bad eating habits. She, couldn't, she could not tell anyone what she had done as far as cheating on the test, but Bafina knew that there had to be some punishment for her sin, so she punished herself. She knew that you could not sin, that she transgressed the law, that God was not pleased with sin and it had to be punished. But rather than stepping into the free gift of the gospel and Christ taking our sin on the cross and receiving our punishment, she decided to punish, it, punish herself. As you break down her logic, it went along these lines. Dad was distant, so she could not tell him. God was displeased with her, so he could not help her. Therefore, she chose to punish herself by not eating. She lived in this ongoing dual tension. On one hand, it was self-atonement, where she paid for her sin, a desire to punish herself through fasting to soothe her guilty conscience. And then on the other hand, self-centeredness, a desire for love that she could attain through her grades, even if it meant cheating. Bafina's idolatrous craving for excellence, as defined by her dad, led her into an isolated, individualistic, and competitive way of thinking and behaving. The irony was that Bafina would 
would bring her report card home to rave reviews at the end of each semester, the applause that she longed to receive. Grandpa was happy because she got good grades. Grandma was happy because of her excellence. Daddy was happy because this is exactly what he wanted. Mom was happy too. Buffina was temporarily happy with their approval ratings. But the gnawing away of her soul was an inconsolable burden that led to uncharacteristic acting out and behavior. Sadly, her daddy was applauding her excellence while perplexed by her weight loss, oblivious to acute longings of her soul, and aiding her in the ongoing ensnaring of idolatry. Mabel knew that there was more to the issue, but she ignored the problems with Biff, hoping that the counselor could correct everything. Buffina had all the answers, but she was not connecting the dots. And so the counselor collected the data, connected the dots, and now the family must determine if they want to address all the pertinent issues to help their daughter. Of course, that process would begin with Biff's recognition of his improper leadership style, their parenting model, and it would, be, it would lead to active repentance, that he is walking out daily, weekly, monthly, changing the way he thinks about parenting, the way he has been leading his family, but there is obviously more to it than that. The title of this is When Education Becomes Deadly to a Child. You can read everything that I just shared with you at lifeovercoffee.com. If you prefer to watch it, the video is available for you, of course, and the podcast that you can listen to on your run. By the way, I have a, a new friend in Delaware who uh, told me when we were doing a conference up there that I was her running buddy. A little awkward, but I understood what she was saying. I have another friend in, uh, um, in, in uh, uh, Saint, uh, in the, in the, uh, the island, uh, Marco Island in Florida, uh, who does a similar thing. And so you can take me as your running buddy by listening to the podcast. But please go over to lifeovercoffee.com and you can look for the article When Education Becomes Deadly to a Child. And you can read it, you can watch it, or you can take me on a run and that would be just fine. I want to wrap up by asking you questions. I've just presented to you a case study. And I don't do this all the time, but this is what this is. And so I've laid it out for you clearly, the case study, the issues at hand. And, and this would be a good teaching tool for a class, a Sunday school, a leadership class, uh, small group leaders to get together, counselors, obviously, and to work through this case study. And I have some questions here that I trust that will help facilitate that. And so here is question one, which is really a statement. Describe how Bifina's unguarded strength had captured her, sto her soul. You remember that's how I began in the beginning, that an unguarded strength is a double weakness. By the way, that came from a devotional that I read a hundred years ago from Oswald Chambers. It just struck me. I don't remember the devotional, but I remember that phrase, and it's like, wow, that is really good, and it is so true. And so as you work through this case study, uh, the first thing is describe how Buffina's unguarded strength, her intellect, her skill has captured her soul. And then how were Biff and Mabel complicit in Buffina's struggle? Because they most definitely are in different ways. What were some of the dots they were not connecting? And what would you teach them to help them understand all the problems uh, in this case study, specifically about Buffina. Number two, what are some of the things Biff must do to practicalize active repentance toward God and his family? Now, you really need to write out a specific plan. I mean, not read your Bible more or look up these three verses. No, he needs to do way more than that. And it needs to be much longer than this week, this month, this year. There needs to be an active plan implemented in Biff's life because there is a long-form shaping influence that you heard 
that I shared about Biff, a multi-decade shaping influence when he told Biffina that was his worst mistake. And so Biff has been captured for, let's say Biff is 35 years old, for more than 30 years, he is habitualized into this wrong thinking. And so as you work through this case study, you need to make sure that, that you have a plan that not only puts him on the path of repentance, but it is measurable to see how he is transforming, which begins with him understanding the problem is a so question number two. What are some of the things Biff must do to practicalize active repentance toward God and his family? And I cannot overstate the three-decade habituation into wrong thinking. Question number three. What would boasting in weakness mean to Biffina? And how could Biff help her to implement this essential truth in her life? Biffina's strength is her kryptonite. I mean, her kryptonite is not being significant, not being loved, not being approved, not being accepted, not being appreciated. Those are the idols that really have captured her heart. And the portal through which she uh, gains those idols is her strength. And so now the Bible is teaching us that that she needs to boast in her weakness so that she can experience the power of God. So Bethina is a self-reliant soul. By the way, if she were to have some, God forbid, aneurysm or something to affect her intellect or her ability uh, to be able to learn, well, her strength is in her ability to be an intellect. And if she lost that, her world would cease to exist and so she is in a precarious place because she's relying on herself and not relying on him who raises the dead. Number four, in what specific ways does Mabel need to repent to God, to Biff, and to Bifina? Mabel is complicit as well. She needs to repent. And then finally number five, what would you teach Bifina about God? And how would you work to make it stick? in her mind. What would her repentance look like, practically speaking? And a lot of it would be centered around this desire of her to please God. But even before you could get to that point, she is angry at God. She's not even willing to please God. She has taken matters into her hands to such a degree that there is a hostile relationship between her and the Lord. What would you do to help her? Uh, to repent regarding her relationship with God. Those are just a few questions. I hope to get things started. The case study is when education becomes deadly to a child. Thank you so much and God bless. Thanks for joining us. Learn more and get access to other resources at lifeovercoffee.com.